of Infrastructure and Energy at IDB Investment. Good morning, everybody. You can hear me? Yep. Bright lights. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, with this distinguished panel. We're going to talk about energy, one of the key pillars uh, really required for the future of, of the region of Latin America. So my name is Carlos Barrera. I'm the CEO of Atlas Renewable Energy. We're one of the largest uh, energy companies in the region, uh, focused just on renewables. And I'm joined by uh, a very distinguished panel here. So we have two representatives from the client demand sector, uh, Jairo Lorenzato, CEO of uh, Latin America for Smurf at West Rock, Shannon Kellogg, the VP of Public <coughs> Policy for the Americas for Amazon Web Services, Elizabeth Robrex, Division Chief of Infrastructure and Energy for IDB Invest, and Juan Ignacio Rubio, no Executive Vice President and President of the National Business Unit and Infrastructure for the AES Corporation. So let's get started. Let me set some context first. Uh, renewables has really become the preeminent uh, generation source for, for new capacity generation, uh, really globally, but certainly in Latin America. We're seeing uh, really an acceleration of that, both globally and in LATAM. 2023 saw about 28 gigawatts of new non-conventional renewable energy sources uh, being built. Uh, new capacity installations of, of 28 gigawatts. That's about three quarters of total capacity installations for energy in the region. It's a huge number. Uh, 2024 is expected to exceed that. At the same time, the urgency of the clean energy transition continues to intensify. We see demand for energy in the region continuing to increase, now not based only on social mobility, but really based on uh, electrification of industries, uh, based on EVs, and over time it, it will be increasingly with data centers, as we're seeing uh, the emergence of that in the region. And there are some concerns on whether that new energy capacity can be implemented quickly enough to satisfy demand. I think that's the challenge that we have. What's clear is the private sector has a huge role to play. Client Client demand will be the catalyst. It has to start there with the client demand to push forward the agenda. But development financing institutions also play a critical role to create frameworks, to mobilize capital. And certainly energy companies have to make the investments and have to bring the technology. So let's begin with the demand side. First, uh, Gyro, can you share the story of the turnaround Smurfit, uh, Smurfit West Rock has had with respect to the energy transition? And specifically, what have been the key drivers for both the paper and pulp industry and for your company, firstly, to source renewables and subsequently to start investing directly into renewables? Thank you. First of all, my first time in the symposium, really great. The prior uh, panel was really great. I hope we can make it up. And we're averaging out the number of, the number of <laughs> females here. So, <laughs> uh, First of all, putting context, Murphy Westrock is a newly merged company. It's been a quarter only. Just today we announced the, the first quarter results, so it's a newly merged company. It's a merge of Murphy Kappa and Westrock. And it's right now the largest packaging company in the world. What do we do? We serve uh, customer CPGs and everything that you buy in the supermarket that you go in the shelves likely has a box behind that. That's what we do. We do packaging based on natural uh, fiber, basically paper, fibers. Fib our business is sustainable packaging. So I, I put uh, energy in the context of sustainability and the core in the context of the core strategy of our company. Our company serves renewable uh, products, recyclable products, biodegradable products. So when we speak about energy, it intertwines with renewable sources, with re renovation and, I love the word, regenerative uh, uh, strategies. We owe that to our customers, we owe that to our, our investors. So most of our strategies are based on that. Some examples of what we do we integrate our strategy 
Um, we integrate our projects, our biomass boilers. So we use a lot of our own forest lands in biomass reproductive systems, where we create our own cogen generative uh, strategies and our cogeneration renewable strategies. I don't call it necessarily a, a transformative strategy, but most of all, it is a evolutionary strategies. We've been doing that for the, it's a secular, uh, uh, it's a secular industry. In Brazil, we have been, for instance, in Brazil, we have invested in cogenerative biomass boilers, uh, reproducting energy from our own forest lands in several stages. The last stage was a $100 million investment in Brazil two years ago. Right now, we are investing in Colombia in another one of our facilities. It's another biomass boiler, again, replicating the same strategy, where we uh, in integrate our biomass production and our, we harvest the biomass uh, wood forestry uh, uh, sources in the region, in both in Colombia and in Brazil, in order to create uh, energy. This is a very intense uh, energy uh, industry. It's a heavy capital industry, intense in energy. So back again, we owe to our customers, bringing to our customers packaging that are renewable, bi biodegradable, and recyclable, the best sources of renewable strategies that we can get. Excellent. So it sounds like you're really leveraging your operations uh, to make your operation more efficient, I guess. Um, let's continue on the private sector now, but let's hear from uh, one of the very large uh, tech sector companies in the region. Um, and let's also maybe start exploring some of the challenges. So turning to Shannon, can you share your transition journey from the Amazon perspective? And in particular, what challenges are you seeing in clean energy supply to this huge impending data center moment that I think LATAM is about to start seeing? How does the energy landscape in LATAM need to evolve over the next decade to address this? And what are the other next-gen technologies that could help accelerate this? First of all, thank you uh, um, for uh, having me on the panel today and uh, for this great conference. Uh, it's really a nice forum. Um, so about a decade ago, Amazon Web Services announced that it was going to become 100% renewable uh, powered worldwide. And initially, we didn't set a date. Uh, but we then, about five years later, as Amazon established something called the Climate Pledge. There are now 500 corporations, over 500 corporations today, that have signed on to the Climate Pledge. But as we announced that initiative, we then came out with a new date that we would be 100% renewable by 2030 across all of our operations at Amazon. And then we also announced that we would be carbon free by 2040, so 10 years ahead of the Paris uh, Treaty. And so we've been working toward those goals very vigorously over the last decade. And, and um, by the end of last year, we were actually able to achieve our 100% renewable energy goal. Uh, do we have some microphone issues here? Uh, did you hear anything I said? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully I don't have to repeat all of it. But um, the, uh, by, by the end of last year, sounds like I may have a, okay. Um, by the end of last year, we then uh, were able to achieve a 100% renewable energy across uh, Amazon. We had actually pushed our deadline up from 2030 to 2025, and so we were then able to achieve uh, the 100% renewable goal just ahead of the 2025 updated goal. So um, we have been investing heavily in this space globally, and uh, we have, over the last four years, become the largest buyer of renewable energy, corporate buyer of renewable energy in the world. And so this is something that we're spending a lot of time and resources on, and we will continue uh, to invest in renewable energy as we look ahead uh, over the next several years. Uh, we're starting to also, as we look at that 2040 carbon-free goal, um, we're starting to uh, invest in nuclear as well, which I can, I can talk a little bit more about. 
uh, during the latter part of the panel. Uh, so that's part of our carbon-free uh, strategy across Amazon. As we continue to expand our operations across Latin America, which we've also been doing pretty um, aggressively over the last decade, uh, the, um, the goal of expanding renewables and investing in renewable projects, of course, is also carried over to Latin America, and we've been investing in both solar and wind utility scale projects in the region. So it's something also that we're uh, going to continue to do. So this continues to be a fundamental part of our broader carbon-free strategy. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, remind me what that was. It Challenges. Was, uh, so um, as we continue to uh, look to invest in the region and uh, expand our infrastructure footprint, so when we look at putting data centers in more places, including in Latin America, it's really important that we have confidence that there is going to be clean energy available. And of course, in addition to wind and solar, that does include uh, from our perspective, hydro, uh, and so that factors in as well. Um, as countries seek to attract these investments, and every time I go um, and visit leaders throughout the region, we often start with their goals of digitizing their economy, but they also, many of them, want to become AI centers, AI hubs. Well, in order to become an AI hub, you do need to be able to attract in that data center infrastructure and establish that foundation in addition to having skills, the right workforce, um, uh, you know, the right economic policies. You do need data center infrastructure. And in order to have data center infrastructure, you need to have energy and a long-term strategy around energy. And we're encouraging them to make sure that they're really thinking about what their clean energy strategy will be as they seek to attract these investments in and then become hopefully an AI center over time. And so uh, one of the challenges in doing that, I've discovered through a lot of these conversations, is some governments will have sort of a plan for part of that, but not a complete plan, for example, around energy generation and energy transmission. And a lot of countries are really struggling with some of the transmission challenges. And by the way, I've spent a lot of time in the U.S. too, and the U.S. is struggling with transmission yeah. challenges, so it's not unique uh, to the Latin America region. But I think that's one of the big challenges I see is, one, make sure that you're really thinking holistically, have a full strategy that includes a clean energy strategy as, as a fundamental part of that. And then, two, make sure that you have a plan to not only generate, but to transmit um, these energy resources to the locations that you need them, and you're thinking and investing long-term to do that. And several countries are, are uh, struggling with that right now. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Um, so it's, it's clear on the demand side, um, you have huge needs for, for new clean energy and visibility over the implementation of that happening, right? For, for you know, these clients to make the, their investments in data centers. I think a big part of that is, is capital, capital mobilization, which, which is perfect <laughs> for Elizabeth. Um, what I'd like to ask you is really, um, what opportunities uh, do you see, Elizabeth, for accelerating the energy transition in LATAM, for mobilizing capital around accelerating that and, and maybe enabling technologies or some of these challenges like transmission, et cetera, which um, are often capital challenges, but, but usually more business model challenges. Um, so so what role does the IDB play there? Well, thank you. Thank you. Um... Ucho, uh, we were just talking about when we first met in Chile over 10 years ago, and we financed the first utility scale solar project in Chile, which seems like a lifetime ago in many ways. So there has been a lot of progress made. And, and just to kind of take a quick step back, IDB, IDB Invest is the private sector part of the IDB group, which is you know, the largest multilateral development bank for Latin America and the Caribbean. And so we have a, a public sector side that is you know, working with governments, as you say, to try to put in place having these conversations about the real investments that need to be made, the changes in regulatory policy that need to be made, the, the, the 
improvements in governance that need to be, need to be made to make these utilities more profitable, to, in, to incentivize investments in the region. And, and that's a key part of the, of the plan of the, of the, you know, what we bring to the table as a multilateral development bank. We have very close relationships with governments because they're our owners, of course. Uh, and we have offices in every single country in the region. But in addition, on the IDB Invest side, we are providing long-term financing, uh, we're providing guarantees, we're providing equity, we have uh, blended finance resources from donors that we try to channel to projects to make projects more profitable and incentivize investors. We, we want investors to make a good return so they'll come back and, make, and invest more. Uh, you know, so, so that I, I agree that the combination, I think it was said in one of the discussions I've been taking part in today, there's a private sector component and a public sector component that are very important. In, in terms of opportunities in the region, we see you know, the, the very significant resources of the region to be an opportunity. The, the energy transition minerals are really requiring quite a bit of investment. 60% uh, of the world's lithium, 40% of the world's copper are in Latin America and the Caribbean. These are major opportunities for investment in the region. And, and the whole discussion of supply chain, you know, I, I think bringing some of the supply chain to the region for us is a real priority. The, the supply chain issue has been limiting factor in terms of allowing us to invest fully in the region or in, those, in these technologies. And so having a 100% a clean sub, uh, enter, uh, supply chain for so some of these technologies is a real priority. And we think an opportunity in the region also can create jobs um, as well. So, it, you know, that, that's part of the, the discussion that we're having right now in terms of specific technologies where we see opportunities. <clears throat> Green hydrogen, for sure, the amount of hydropower, the amount of, uh, you know, baseload, very strong renewable energy assets that the region has are, are attracting investment in green hydrogen. We have two mandates already that we're working on. This is a component of reducing the carbon emissions for some of these heavy industries that are, are relevant to the region as well. We have seen quite a bit of growth in, in this kind of uh, circular economy type of discussions, which, which Ira was mentioning, of utilizing your own resources to create um, to create energy uh, and, and in using animal waste, using pulp and paper, all kinds of opportunities related to, to that sector in the region, which we are also supporting. Uh, so overall, I would say there's quite a bit of activity going on. A big, big component of it, I, I do believe, is, is getting the right incentives in place. And you know, as IDB Invest, what we want to be able to do is risk mitigation taking the risk away so that that capital can be mobilized, as you say. If it's country risk, if it's technology risk, if it's you know, whatever environmental and social governance risk, reduce risk so that private investment feels comfortable of coming into the region and, and, and bringing new projects and, and new investment to the region. Specifically um, on BESS, Elizabeth, are you guys yeah. seeing a lot of BESS battery storage investments? That's a key enabler for renewable energy. Do you see a lot of that happening in the region now? Yes, yes. We just closed a transaction yesterday in the Dominican Republic for, for solar plus BESS. Uh, this is a technology that obviously has a lot of potential to help resolve a lot of these transmission issues or, or some of the transmission issues and, and have a more steady, uh, less, less problems with transmission, but also it's a very scalable technology and we've seen, we've been investing in, in BESS in ranging from very tiny projects in the Amazon all the way to huge projects in, uh, in, in large countries with, with utility scale projects. So very relevant, again, some of, the, some of the regulatory framework, I'm not sure is quite there in some of the countries to really incentivize um, and to compensate, but many investors are doing it anyway because of the curtailment issues that they're facing and that that's the only way that they can make their projects profitable is to be able to be you know, dispatching in the, in the evening hours as well. So it's becoming a, a relevant technology in the region for, for many reasons and uh, something that we are very actively supporting. Thank you. So that's the demand side. Um, <clears throat> we've we've heard you know we, there needs to be clarity around future um, uh, you know energy policies in the different countries. Uh, we've heard from the capital side around frameworks that we need to put in place to uh, further enable capital mobilization. Let's hear from the supply side. Uh, 
the generation company. So, so from, from an energy generation perspective, what do you see, uh, Juan Ignacio, as the main challenges you're facing to kind of meet this demand and deploying large-scale renewable projects in LATAM? And also, if I may, how are you seeing technological advancements to um, bridge the gap, essentially, of where we've come from in terms of renewables playing a role, but maybe unable to play the full role? To how do we get renewables to play the full role in the region? Very well. First of all, thank you for, for having me here. It's a pleasure, as always. But um, I think on the supply side, we are pretty much sharing the same concerns, or, or, or we see the same challenges than on the demand side. Right? I think we are all together on the same boat here. Um, if, if I had to, um, to highlight certain challenges, I think we have common challenges uh, that are the ones that are being shared across the world, uh, regardless of the, of the regional uh, position of each um, uh, you know, country or market, and then you have specific challenges we have you know, for LATAM itself, right? So I think as a common, um, as a common theme across the board, I think that the main challenges we have, I think I would say two slash three. Uh, the first one is transmission. I think that we have uh, a big um, constraint out there uh, because our transmission system was built uh, back in the days where we had a totally different uh, energy ecosystem as a whole, right? And now we need to connect or interconnect much more equipment, different type of equipment, and we will require a totally different network and grid uh, in the near future. So that's a big, big challenge. And we have long queues uh, around the world. You have, you know, some kind of sweet spots, but in the end of the day, we are all facing the same kind of uh, um, concern everywhere. So LATAM is not an exception on that. I think technology is coming to play a role in order to improve that situation or unlock that constraint, and we can discuss that later. I think the second thing is um, what it has to do, and that's very regional in our re in, in LATAM, which is regulation and uh, permits, right? So getting access or getting approvals or getting the, the right permits on time is kind of a challenging thing. I think that we need to compete for investments and, and having the right regulation in place, which means not just having more regulation, it's having the right regulation in place, which is a totally different thing, especially considering what's next, not what we have today. I think we tend to keep on planning the old way, which is basically having a kind of an, uh, a very discreet type of approach. And the future of our networks and grids are gonna be totally different than what we used to have and dealt with. So that means basically they will have to uh, strategically plan and put in place the right, the right regulation, much more modern in terms of integrating different um, technologies in the same uh, grid for a future uh, sustainable system. So that's something that as well we are kind of lagging behind somehow. We have, as LATAM, it's not just one region, we have different uh, markets you know, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, being part of a region, but you have different type of uh, regulations and different type of uh, situations in terms of when it comes to uh, the degree of modernization of the different systems, right? So, um, and then you have, uh, of course, uh, capital. I think it's not just about getting access to capital, it's how efficient we deploy capital and how costly that capital is for LATAM. I think we need to compete for investments uh, with our regions. We, we, our region is still, instead, is in terms of cost of capital, not the most uh, uh, competitive one. So we need to continue working on that. It has to do with how to minimize certain risks in order to make our uh, investments more appealing. But at the same time, uh, our biggest challenge as human beings, which is climate change, um, I think that that comes with as well with a lot of uh, cons, which is, you know, it's, very, it's getting harder and harder to get insurance for these equipments going forward. I think it's, it's kind of a, a, this, this discussion around how to adapt to the, new, to the new norm when it comes to climate change, that poses a lot of uh, burdens into the investments. And of course, that might uh, create uh, a challenge as well for our investments going forward. 
I think overall, supply chain was mentioned as well. I will not reiterate that, but I think that uh, it's always there, especially with this geopolitical tension between the US and China, that you know, China is playing a particular role in LATAM, especially in the energy sector, which is another you know, security issue that, that could be addressed as well. But, but I think that uh, a supply chain will, be, will always be a, you know, will be a, you know, a challenge to, to point out as well in the region. So overall, I would say those four things are uh, at least our view on, on what are the main challenges uh, to continue unlocking the value of, of, of renewables in LATAM. With the footnote that uh, perhaps many people know, but others know that Latin America is the, re is the most sustainable region in the world, right? So Latin America, when it comes to energy, the energy mix, right? So we generate roughly 65% of our energy from you know, using um, renewable um, sources. Right, so that's kind of you know we are not coming from uh, from scratch. I think we are we need to continue evolving and continue transitioning toward a much more sustainable environment. And then when it comes to new technologies, I think new technologies should help us, and that's where the value is for LATAM. And I think if we are clever enough to leapfrog somehow the constraints we have, and and jump straight to the new techs that we can apply, you know, very fastly in our regions, and that has to do with the first. Or the, or the biggest challenge we have, which has to do with transmission. And there we are already implementing in the region, uh, not in all the markets, unfortunately, but in few of them. Hopefully we'll see them more you know, uh, commonly used in our markets, but we are working on from storage systems. That is kind of a boom as we speak. I think that uh, we started the business back in 2009 with a very tiny storage system in Chile. Uh, now we have more than 300 megawatts, and we are planning to have 1.5 gigawatts in the next three years. So I think it's kind of a, that's the massive growth that we are envisioning when it comes to technologies based or, or storage. We have not just to allow more penetration of renewable, but also to unlock or better use the existing transmission capacity we have and uh, get rid of the, of the bottlenecks that we are, we are facing today. So there's another, you know, what is what they're called, you know, grid enhancement technologies. It has to do with uh, um, dynamic, you know, uh, rate in lining, which is basically trying to use more the capacity of our existing grid because our grid, uh, unfortunately, is being used, you know, generally, but in a lot of time it's being used between 45, it's less than 50 percent of its capacity, especially for security purposes, right? Uh, if we can increase that usage, 5%, we are talking about you know, gigawatts, a lot of energy that we can continue transmitting using the existing grid. So I think that that has to do with, with, um, with transmission. Um, storage will not only deal with transmission, but also to you know, help uh, kind of uh, stabilize the different systems and providing new services that are going to be needed. And then there's another thing, and I will finish with this, is that we need to find ways, and this is across the board, not just LATAM, but LATAM, I think we are starting to face in that, is that we're going to need to have, or make sure that we are in the transition. And it, during the transition, we need to make sure that we keep the lights on in every single market. And in order to find the balance of the famous trilemma between reliability, sustainability, and affordability, I think we need to find modern ways of remunerating the greed of the future. Because in the future, we're gonna, we're gonna be most likely based on renewables most of the time, but we're gonna need certain technologies that will play a role as well, that as we speak, are not remunerated. And those are technologies that, for instance, most of the thermal units that are gonna be eventually there uh, with, with a different composition, they're, gonna, they're not gonna be used most likely for energy. They're gonna use for very small, portion of the day where they need that capacity that renewables cannot you know, uh, uh, be at the forefront. So anyway, with that, I think that um, challenges and, and opportunities and technology will play definitely a big role. Thank you, Ignacio. I think the, the challenges are very clear. I think it's, it's been like this for some years. I think if I may, yeah, I, please, I would like sir. to add, it's a challenge, but it's not necessarily a roadblock as people, as my panel peers here have put like transmission, reliability, and other supply chain issues. I think to your point, I think you made a great point. 
Uh, I think Latin America is not just yet globally recognized as a truly highly sustainable region in terms of the products and the energy matrix that it, that it provides. That paradigm, I think, needs to be worked. And it's upon uh, leaders to work on that. It's upon governments, for sure, which are, I agree, are, are roadblocks. But I align that with creating a, a critical mass to create a quality of demand. So, and quality of demand meaning more renewable products that come from renewable supply chains or more renewable supply chains, to me, will circle back and you will, over time, attract more capital, more investment. Uh, so, I think there is, I would like to add that this kind of global paradigm that perhaps in Latin America, because of Amazon and other aspects, and it's, it's still a so-called underdevelopment, underdeveloped world, or I prefer in highly, in high, in high speed of development, which is what I prefer. And adding to everything that was said, this is a high growth region. It's always been, it's a bumpy tr track, but it's a high growth region. So connecting high growth region with renewable, uh, and I would say more broadly sustainable assets, and perhaps demolishing that, that paradigm, I, I would dare to say, in the future, we'll tend to attract more and more speed of capital investment. So, yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think it's it's a high growth region that is about to go into acceleration on the energy side as well. And I think the opportunities um, that you know we talked about very briefly before we and outnumber that. Um, I, I want to get to something else that I also think is very important that we haven't really addressed. Please, Shannon. Go ahead. So I, I agree. You know, with, um, I think you need your, your mic. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, so uh, I uh, I agree with the fundamental points uh, that you were making there. One thing, though, I I really want to make sure that governments in the region are thinking about. And and again, you know, I spent a lot of time that, uh, on this in the U.S. where we don't have the transmission infrastructure in place to do what the country is going to need to do over the next decade in terms of its energy supply, you know, not only on the generation side, but getting clean energy sources to, you know, the places that need it. And the, the thing I want um, folks in Latin America to think about is, as we're doing everything that you just said, make sure, because it takes so long to, to put the right infrastructure in place, you know, the right transmission infrastructure. Think about this now. Take steps now to prepare for the growth that you're talking about. Because I do believe in the potential of the region. I think there's going to be a lot of growth. I think there are going to be a lot of places that become AI centers, but have the long-term strategy in plan to get there. A lot of people are talking about it, but I'm still not seeing enough plans to actually get there on the transmission side. So. Fair point. Um, let's, let's touch on something else that's related to everything that we do, all the projects that we build, all the infrastructure. Um, and, and let's get your, your thoughts about this. What, what uh, strategies are uh, your companies adopting to ensure that the clean energy transition is also just? That is, it provides tangible benefit to local regional communities. Um, could, can you guys describe some of the programs? You, or how, how are you thinking about this as, as different constituents? Can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we are, uh, oh, we are trying to lead the transitions in all the markets we are, we are in. And, uh, and one of the main um, approach we have, I would say, is that what we call it 360 approach, which is basically having, has to do with dealing with all the stakeholders we, we deal with in order to make sure we don't leave any one of them you know, behind us, right? So I think that as, as, as examples, I would say that um, I think we are very uh, focused on making sure we can really transition because we are coming from a, it's, it's a 40 year company where we started with coal and hydro, then we transitioned through uh, to renewables, you know, going through gas, through natural gas as well. So now we are facing out all our coal units. And of course we need to deal with our employees, right, and our people. So we implemented uh, training programs where we accompany them throughout this process. And so we have most of our people have evolved from coal asset type of generation all the way down to renewables nowadays. So we have kind of uh, um, 
included them in this transition as part of the of a key uh, component in order to be successful. So they embrace the transition, they embrace the challenges, and most of them are now uh, working in the new technologies, right? So that's one of the concrete examples that we are really very proud of, uh, of sharing. Uh, we have programs in most of the, of the, of the markets where we have thermal generation, uh, pretty much copy, you know, copy and paste in these type of, of programs, and, and, and actually are being shared with other companies as well. And then, of course, uh, um, just to avoid monopolizing the, the, the discussion, but I think that we are working very, very, I would say, um, uh, focused on our, not just our surrounding communities, but also with our communities in general, you know, the markets where we are in. I think we, we need to make sure that we can really pro propose them a value proposition where we can really uh, demonstrate that they're going to be part of this, uh, uh, of this journey. Uh, and that has to do with programs related to education, programs related to um, training on uh, related matters or non-related matters. I think the idea is to bring prosperity in all the markets where we are in. With, with just one caveat, I think that the renewable boom, I would say, or expansion, I think is coming with a much more impact to our society, right? Because in the past, we used to just put up you know, a few power plants and we impacted much less communities, right? Because of the nature of, that, of the traditional pieces. Nowadays, we have much more uh, land, we have much needed, we have much more communities that are required in order to be involved in our projects in order to be successful. Thank you. Shannon, do you, you want to also take that one? Also, um, maybe in your answer, if you can <clears throat> describe a little bit, what do you see the timeline in LATAM for the huge data center growth? Obviously, we're seeing it in the States and o other OECD markets. Where do you see that coming in in LATAM? Yeah, uh, well, one of the things um, that we're doing across Amazon, and I still think I have my... Oh, on. Uh, one of the things um, that we uh, did across Amazon uh, several years ago is establish a climate fund. And we're making investments in emerging technologies, but as we look at um, uh, emerging technologies and organizations to invest in with the climate fund. We're also, uh, you know, eager to work with female and minority uh, leaders, you know, who are establishing new businesses um, uh, around climate uh, solutions. And so that's something that we're just making direct investments into emerging companies and spending a lot of time on that. One thing I'd like to do, and I'll just you know have a call to action in the audience if, if there's a partner on, out there who can work with us on this. One of the things that we um, uh, did in the US was uh, work with the American Council for Renewable Energy here to establish a few years ago something called the Accelerate Program. And the Accelerate program is basically focused on uh, women-owned and minority-owned small uh, uh, emerging businesses focused on the renewable energy sector. And Amazon was the first um, uh, funder of this initiative. And since that time, uh, the um, initiative has received uh, support from a whole range of uh, energy companies and technology and financial companies, and it's this really successful program now, training lots of cohorts every year annually in the U.S. And one thing I'd like to do is bring that concept to Latin America. So if, if you're out there in an association or a third party that, that has some ideas on how we can expand an initiative like that, I'd love to do it. Um, and that's something that we're really, really focused on and how to provide more opportunities for entrepreneurs uh, uh, who are um, uh, female-owned uh, uh, businesses and, and also minority-owned businesses. In terms of the data center explosion, um, uh, you know, in, in Latin America, it, it is definitely happening and countries are eager, uh, you know, to attract that investment, as I mentioned earlier. One um, thing that I'm noticing uh, as I look at what the different countries are doing is there are some who have very specific pronounced strategies um, where they have, uh, you know, an AI strategy. They may also be putting some guardrails in place around the use of Gen AI, but they also have a very specific plan uh, around energy and to attract data center investment. Uh, one um, 
a country that sort of uh, is fresh in my memory because I visited it just a few months ago and we do have operations there is Chile. And Elizabeth was talking earlier about how IDB invested in these renewable energy um, solar uh, uh, or these solar farms uh, in uh, the north of Chile uh, several years ago. The Chileans, as they started to um, look at ways to become an AI center and to attract investment in that space, of course, also uh, developed a plan to put um, to develop their trunk line to get that solar down into Santiago and other areas. But they didn't stop there. They now have developed a really comprehensive strategy to attract data center investments. And part of their planning process is also to anticipate impacts on local communities, whether it be uh, water use, which you know is a is a challenge in a country like Chile where they have. Um, some water and drought challenges, uh, but also, again, you know, making sure that they're working locally uh, as communities have questions about data center and what that would, data centers and what that would mean for their communities. So it's, it's a country, I think, that has a very comprehensive uh, all-in strategy, and I would encourage, other, encourage others to sort of look in that direction as well. Th thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. Um, if, if we could just leave you with a message, I think we, we laid out a series of challenges, but the reality is the opportunity that we see in LATAM is, is just enormous. Um, and some of these challenges are being addressed. Uh, and I think there's high optimism that they will continue to be addressed. So with that, look, thank you to the panel members thank you for your participation. Please welcome, please welcome to the stage the keynote speaker of our next session, Hayam Israel, Global Strategist, Head of Global Thematic Research and ba at Bank of America. <laughs>